Well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today um, for a discussion of creating the compassionate city. I'm really looking forward to hearing about ideas and projects that have been underway to make LA a place of kindness and connection. Uh, I'm Rebecca Lowry, assistant curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. And this program is being presented under the auspices of Art Rise which is a series of 18 outdoor art installations and performances in and around downtown Los Angeles, commissioned um, by We Rise, which is an initiative of the Department of Mental Health in Los Angeles County that encourages well-being through art, community, and connection. As part of this project, we've commissioned a new performance from the Los Angeles Poverty Department called The New Compassionate Downtown, which will premiere at the Geffen Contemporary at MOCA in Little Tokyo on Saturday, oh, sorry, Friday, May 14th, followed by a performance on Saturday, May 15th. Um, and you can find more details about those performances at mocha.org. So I'm gonna say a little few words about our esteemed panelists. Uh, we have with us today, Karen Mack, uh, who holds a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University where she studied the role of culture in community building. She's the founding director of LA Commons, which leverages art and cultural approaches to create positive change. LA Commons's projects are motivated by the belief that all communities possess local knowledge and local assets, that ordinary people, people have the power to meet the challenges facing their neighborhoods through their sense of connectedness with place and each other, and that culture is an essential tool an essential community resource for elevating these assets and affecting change. We also have with us Charles Porter. Charles Porter has worked for 20 plus years in Skid Row with the United Coalition East Prevention Project to challenge systemic conditions and social disparities that threaten a healthy environment. Charles is a poet and a drummer with a deep understanding of Pan-African artistic healing traditions he has worked with coalitions of residents time and time again to identify and bring about needed change in Skid Row. The Skid Row Improvement Coalition collectively envisioned a neighborhood hygiene center, the Refresh Spot, that was realized with the support of the city and now serves more than 1,000 residents a day, providing showers and laundry facilities as well as 24-hour bathroom access while employing Skid Row resident staff. And finally, we have with us Jeremy Liu, who is an artist and social impact strategist with a successful track record of developing community benefits by design real estate projects. As the senior fellow for arts, culture, and equitable development at PolicyLink, Jeremy has shaped and is guiding an initiative that integrates arts and culture into the work of equitable development. And moderating our discussion is, of course, John Malpede founding artistic director of the Los Angeles Poverty Department. John founded LADP, LAPD in 1985, and is the first performance group in the nation comprised primarily of homeless and formerly homeless people. LAPD creates performances that connect lived experience to the social forces that shape the lives and communities of people living in poverty. John has taught at UCLA, NYU and the Amsterdam School for Advanced Research in Theater and Dance. And he's the 2013 recipient of the Doris Duke Performing Artist uh, Fellowship. He recently opened in recent years the Skid Row History Museum and Archive and Exhibition and Performance Space Exploring Gentrification, uh, which opened in 2015. And with that, I will turn it over to you for what is going to be an amazing discussion. Um, okay, hi there, everybody. So um, I wanted to talk brief, very briefly about our uh, upcoming performance, The New Compassionate Downtown. Um, the project started as a, a project name because it has other elements, is, uh, was compassion and self-deception and sort of was struggling with the, the disconnect between the voters of LA wanting to create uh, permanent housing and then not wanting it anywhere near them. So, but we, um, Ultimately, we um, focused on the, on the, on the compassionate uh, character of the Skid Row neighborhood, um, which uh, in the 70s, rather than being bulldozed and developed, 
uh, became the only enclave in, in Los Angeles that was only allowed to have very, very low income housing. So all the slum hotels were renovated, um, support services were brought to the neighborhood and a real and the community took root. And so now, uh, you know, 60 years later, we have uh, not only permanent residents, but a vibrant community they have created. And uh, what uh, Rebecca mentioned about the Skid Row Improvement Coalition is an example of the achievements of the community when, when they are listened to. And um, so we, uh, in our performance, we're imagining what if rather than marketing downtown Los Angeles as a nightlife, let's get crazy destination, we it were marketed as a place where people of any economic or other strata could come and participate in a really meaningful community where people cared about suffering of others and the alleviation and prevention thereof, hence the new compassionate downtown. Um, so um, that was our starting point and um, it, it turns out that even though Skid Row has been misrepresented quite a bit recently, um, uh, there are also other ideas about about how such a, such a compassionate neighborhood that exists for uh, very low income people could cre be created in other parts of town, and we're going to get to that later. But first, um, when I when I broached talking about compassion to uh, the people here, all of them said, "Oh yeah, I want to do that." So. Without further ado, I'm inviting them to do that, starting with Karen Mack. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, to talk about this subject that really is, I think, at the essence of what motivates me um, uh, in general um, and in my work, and to be you know, on a panel with these other great panelists. Um, when I started LA Commons, I was, I was really thinking about this idea of social capital and recognizing that um, social capital is a value as much as financial capital. And it's one of the things that Los Angeles struggles with the most. Um, uh, you know, I think all urban, you know, large urban uh, places struggle with this. Like, I, well, obviously every place in America is struggling with this now in many places. Um, but um, we in Los Angeles are unique because of our expansive geography and our uh, except, you know, tremendous diversity and, um, you know, just our culture, which is kind of oriented around the single family house. So I, uh, from my place on the city planning commission, I just learned like most of LA is zoned for single family housing. So that in and of itself creates, you know, this challenge to cross, um, you know, to make connection. And it, and it really is that connection, I think, that we work on at LA Commons, creating ways through art and culture for people to connect with each other and interact. It's not just like meeting, but it's actually working together to build trust, to get to know each other, that creates the empathy that is the heart of compassion. And one of the things that I've been saying is that the problem with coronavirus is that it doesn't bring, you know, when you have to, to isolate, you don't come into contact with strangers. And it's really that coming into contact with strangers that cultivates compassion because it, um, you know, you find out that the other isn't as scary as you thought they were. And so, um, so we really focus on, you know, making, creating these opportunities to get to know the other, to get to know, um, you know, that, um, you know, everybody has a story to tell and it's often incredibly beautiful and um, compelling and worth uh, getting to know. The last thing I want to say is that I really feel like compassion, the model for compassion is like the village model. I think, you know, when you talk about a place where there is an opportunity for everybody to invest in making the place what we all envision. And, um, and so, you know, like creating a place like, you know, I think your work, John, has been, and in my work, um, really like getting people involved in 
in thinking about their communities and um, envisioning them so that they, you know, everybody feels invested and connected and, uh, you know, can live their life um, in a way that uh, allows them to achieve, you know, their dream, um, which may not be the American dream, which is, you know, like we always come up with these narratives like that nobody relates to, but, but you know, like what is your dream and how do we help you get there? So I know you wanna move on, so I'll stop there. That's great, thank you. Thank you. And um, I, I failed to say, if you wanna write a, a question into the chat, um, later on we'll field those questions. So thanks, Karen. Uh, Charles. Let me unmute myself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as was mentioned in my intro, I've been working in Skid Row for 20 plus years. And so I try to <laughs> keep my 20 plus years of experience uh, abbreviated. Um, first, I want to say that um, I really love Skid Row. I love working in Skid Row. The, the, the community is very unique. I've learned a lot, learned a lot working there. And uh, I think for me, that's part of the uh, the essence of uh, compassion is is that sense of connection uh, and that willingness to to learn. Uh, I like to share, I like to teach, but it's a reciprocal relationship. Uh, meeting people where they are. Uh, so I work for United Coalition East. It's a uh, drug prevention program. Uh, this year is our 25th year working in Skid Row. And uh, for folks that don't know, um, some of the, the struggles and engagement that you see in Skid Row is, are things that, that people shouldn't have to fight for. You know, uh, bless the folks that do stand up and fight for it. But when, I first, when we first started working in Skid Row, we just asked community members. Our goal was to look at what are some factors in the community that contribute to alcohol and other drug related problems. And, um, how can we help improve the neighborhood? And people who are impacted are experts, you know, but no one sits down and talk, you know, or to ask the question and uh, people have all these views of who the homeless are. And um, what we found is that, uh, and now you hear people using these terms, experiential um, expertise and lived experience, but uh, people have always had lived experience. You know, it's just a matter of listening and sharing and working together. And that was our approach is we're not going to come into Skid Row and tell you how to clean up Skid Row. We want to know what you feel the problems are and what you feel some of the solutions are. And uh, our, one of our first campaigns was, was cleaning up nuisance businesses. So it, it's not true people wanted to live in rundown neighborhoods. No, people wanted th their quality of life they wanted to be improved. They wanted the liquor stores cleaned up. They wanted the bars cleaned up. They wanted the nuisance hotels cleaned up. And we had to fight to make that happen. We went to the planning department and the, the, the director of the planning department at the time, uh, Bob Genovici, he literally told community members that, that had, you know, compiled complaints. Well, this is Skid Row, what do you want me to do? as if, you know, Skid Row is you know, a special, unique uh, neighborhood that is outside the laws and rules of, of the city. And we were like, well, what do you do in other neighborhoods? And, and it was like, it boggled his mind that people in Skid Row would be asking for a, be a better neighborhood because he didn't view it as a neighborhood. And that's a challenge we still struggle with. Uh, we, we see that in our fight to, to have Skid Row Neighborhood Council. We didn't realize how, how dangerous it is for, for Skid Row to have a voice. That's actually a threat. You know, um, the former city attorney joined the fight against Skid Row having a voice. And uh, that raises a lot of questions. Um, but uh, over the years, I've been able to see really phenomenal uh, changes in the community that came from community members having an opportunity to be heard and to sit at the table with decision makers and to match their vision with resources. Um, and the intro we referenced the refresh spot as really a shining example. And uh, I, I was fortunate to be at the table when, when, when folks came together and said, okay, what would a hygiene center in Skid Row look like? And, and the community, that was their first response. It was like, nobody wants to go to uh, a hygiene center. 
you know, uh, we got to rename it. It has to be a place that is welcoming. It has to be a place that feels like community. There has to be music. There have to be people that have lived experience working there. It has to be a, a space that is welcoming. And, and the community came up with the name, the Skid Row Community uh, Refresh Spot. And so, um, as I was saying earlier, this was something people had to fight for, but it, it builds off of a previous fights just for toilets. Um, the fight, there was a fight just to put porta potties on the street. And then that extended uh, to a fight to have permanent restrooms in our parks, you know, and that, and while this is happening, there are efforts to remove them, you know, and so, so it's this, this game that's being played uh, when you talk about compassion, some of the the policy changes um, that we've seen are motivated by the fear of people who are moving downtown <laughs> and they're concerned about um, illness spreading from Skid Row and impacting them. You know, so when we talk about cleaning up the streets or uh, providing hygiene resources, a, a lot of that discussion was, and this was prior uh, to the pandemic around some contagious disease that may spread from the homeless people and reach the uh, uh, that threatened efforts of, of redevelopment downtown. And so, um, so on our end, we really had to fight just to have the local needs being addressed, being met, being acknowledged. To this day, it still is a main a major struggle, and, and we see that in some of our our push around the uh, the community plan. I'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I wanted to, there was another point that I wanted to highlight, um, let me see, about alcohol fuel redevelopment. So that's the other point I want to uh, bring up is that um, any development, redevelopment, it should support local need. And that's, that's what the community's been asking for. We need community spaces. We need to build upon this sense of connection. We've been using uh, in our prevention efforts the hashtag Skid Row Connected um, because in the prevention field, we view connection as the opposite of addiction and connection is, is what creates wellness it, uh, that supports mental wellness. Uh, that reduces substance abuse. And so the sense of connection has really been hindered with uh, the, 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 the approach to uh, social distancing. So we talk about, you know, physical distancing, but staying socially connected. And so, um, but we fought repeatedly to, to make sure that changes downtown don't follow the same narrative as usual, as John mentioned earlier, um, uh, a place to come and party, you know, the, the new downtown. Um, the, in the five census tracts uh, connected to Skid Row, the state only allows 27 alcohol uh, licenses and currently 273 exist. That's ridiculous. The state allows 27 and 273 exist and, and, and too much is not enough. Uh, the pandemic has slowed some of that down, but uh, definitely uh, we need to broaden those, those conversations about what is community development, what is needed to support neighborhood and community building. And the last thing I would say is um, in my artistic uh, uh, endeavors is um, compassion for me is also important uh, for folks to be in tune with the time and with the rhythm is, is an energy. There's a spiritual side to it as well as just being able to be a part of the space that you're in. Acknowledging the people who were there before you, but also taking the time to just be and just connect with the people around you without coming in there with a view of how you're going to change things, uh, I think is important. Cool, Charles. Thank you. And Jeremy. Yeah, that was uh, amazing um, insights. Um, thanks for sharing that, Charles. And Karen, thank you for the context you're providing as well. Um, I have spent many years uh, doing development, real estate development, and working in, uh, as, well, as well as working in equitable policy change, and really i um, excited by the work that I've seen that Skid Row has been doing um, as a community to really lift up the idea that um, it's this, you know, coherent, complete, and, you know, 
by any other measure, if you took out the word homeless, it'd be a successful neighborhood, right? Where there are deep relationships to place and each other. <laughs> there are um, resources that communities feel like they have agency to, to demand for and, and build. In some ways, I feel like Skid Row needs to be a model for all neighborhoods, right? Where uh, the, the disconnection that folks have been feeling, not just fueled by but the pandemic, but by politics, by the divisiveness, um, need to, you know, look at Skid Row as a model for understanding like ways back to where we are taking a, a mutual sense of responsibility for one another. Um, I, 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 in some ways, I want to riff off a little bit of the few things that Karen and Charles, you mentioned that really, I think are pointed examples of how compassion is missing in the way we think about constructing place. Uh, for example, Karen, when you talked about uh, really cultivating the capacity to get to know the other, you know, one of the big challenges of the way affordable housing is built and designed in the United States right now, which I've been, I've been complicit in, is that the two main strategies for designing affordable housing, generally speaking, are make it fade into the background, right? Look, just like anything else, so you could would never know that it's affordable housing, that there's some kind of social or public good being manifest in that place. And the other, again, the, the vast majority of affordable housing is designed this way. The other strategy is to make it look really special and really nice and like a market rate housing that it couldn't possibly be poor people, you know, people who need affordable housing living there. And that you know, there were reasons why, right? Because there were a lot of opposition to affordable housing for many years. But what we've done is overshoot and the use of aesthetics in some ways to overshoot sort of a goal to the point now where you would have no idea if you happen to have a really great interaction with someone on the street while you were walking their dog or they were walking their dog. And you saw them later on go into a building and not have any idea that that actually might've been an affordable housing building where you got to say to yourself, wow, you know, boy, that person who lives there, whatever stereotype I might be carrying or bias I might be carrying about who that person might be, I have no idea. You have no idea that that signal is, is, been, is, is a signal because you can't tell. And so I think this idea of compassion, even in the way you design buildings, not to hide and not to you know, disguise, but to really make it present, right? As a way of understanding that we have to get, to accept that there is going to be other before you can even start to get into a relationship with other. And in a lot of ways, I think that's one of the big, amazing successes really of Skid Row for that, for LA, that there is a place that you know that it's visible, that it's present, that it's not hidden, that um, you can actually understand that the people you might encounter if you happen to be there or find your way there, um, come from a, a situation in their life or a circumstance, and you can actually see that you can actually have a relationship with them as humans, right, as people. Um, the other thing I want to just reflect on is just this idea that Skid Row, as people don't even recognize it or view it as a neighborhood, and I think that's another sort of really um, great point. When I worked for many years in Ch Boston Chinatown have the exact same problem. So the idea of othering a whole social unit, you know, as one giant, you know, whether you're being discriminated against as a household or an individual, or you're being marginalized as a whole social unit, as a whole neighborhood, that happens in many, many different neighborhoods. And again, something to rally around, I think, as a common experience, but also to have compassion for other the other in our society where there are you know, over one in three Americans right now live at, near poverty. And if we can't even understand that that's one in three people we see and encounter in our daily lives, um, we need to figure out ways of uh, uh, really recognizing that. But in Boston's Chinatown, um, it took us creating a, a film a summer annual film festival for people to get to be out seeing films, but to see not just different types of neighbors together, but to see gr not just kids in pajamas, because it, you know parents might bring their kids in pajamas to come see the films at night, but to see grown adults in pajamas for people to realize that, oh, wait a minute, there's actually people who live in this neighborhood, <laughs> right? Because in, in that case, the Boston, uh, Chinatowns are seen as usually commercial restaurant shop 
areas. And so for that to happen in uh, arts and culture as a strategy for seeing how that happens, um, helping people recognize the other and recognize places and to have therefore have compassion for them. I just want to just point out um, a few resources that that we've developed a policy link and others have developed that really can uh, bring some tools and thinking and support folks who are joining us today to think about how compassion can show up. One is a website called communitydevelopment.art. It really is trying to center the idea that art is an integral part of community development. And there's a pile of resources there about social fabric and how arts and culture can help uh, community development really connect into the social fabric of a place. Um, there's references to a new report on we making, which is about social cohesion and arts and culture strategies and the tools and resources and opportunities for arts and culture to really bridge um, uh, to create more social cohesion. And then lastly, one specific reference for folks because you're in LA is really excited to just shout out a project that um, an artist colleague of mine in LA has completed recently called Inventions for Little Tokyo. If you just uh, Google that uh, term, Inventions for Little Tokyo, you'll find an artist working with a community member to create, in some ways, mini monuments that become accessible ways for folks to get to know and understand what uh, the Little Tokyo neighborhood is about. And again, these are all strategies for trying to like intervene in the systems to create um, more compassion um, in communities. The last thing I'll just say is uh, compassion, again, can be weaponized, right? And compassionate conservatism is not what <laughs> compassionate Republicans, compassionate conservatism is not what we're after. It's really, in some ways, this idea that we actually have to make progressivism and liberal more compassionate as well, because that's actually a place that I think there's a huge breakdown in this division between com having compassion and not really being willing to act on and really um, take a stand for uh, those uh, th folks and people and places you might have compassion for, but really compassionate um, progress is uh, really needs to be called out. So I'll leave it there and we can get into um, really the conversation. Very cool. So um, yeah, I, I, I'll briefly say, um, Karen, when you said about getting to know the other, that, and uh, that's already been remarked on, that's really so much what it's, what it's all about, I think. And, um, and Skid Row in that sense is, is, is light years ahead of most of the the, the country, I would say, because, and I, I certainly learned that in my time uh, working in Skid Row, that, um, that the, the, the diversity of all kinds among the people there, um, people have a, a, a highly developed uh, sense of how to, how to respect and deal with other people who are, who are, you know, come from different places and have all kinds of difference differences because they uh, they get to regularly interact with one another. So um, that's, I don't think that's acknowledged uh, very often. Um, I want to go on to our next, um, to, to, the, to the question, which I was saying earlier, um, while, um, and has been laid out here, sometimes Skid Row is not even acknowledged as a neighborhood. In fact, it's a very strong neighborhood and one that was created by the residents, but also years ago, well, during the height of the urban renewal period after Bunker Hill community had been completely disappeared and that space corporatized, the same thing was going to happen to Skid Row. But instead, uh, in, a, in a visionary moment, the, the, uh, ultimately the city uh, marked this area of 50 square blocks as a place where there could only be uh, low income housing and, the, and the, they created nonprofits to buy up what was then slum housing and renovate it, et cetera. And so that created a neighborhood that was not directly under threat, although because of its central location, it's continued to be under threat of displacement, but one in which people and services could, could work together and so create um, a real neighborhood. And, and where things like um, the coalitions that Charles worked in and LA Can and a bunch of other things have showed up you know, we did, we did a project called Biggest Recovery Community Anywhere um, a couple of years ago, and we counted 53 me, uh, recovery meetings run by people living in the neighborhood because they had their um, free recovery programs were in the neighborhood. People 
graduated out of those programs, they stayed in the neighborhood because the housing was there. And so there was a very, and they, and they uh, generated, uh, you know, uh, programs to uh, meetings. They were responsible for started meetings to, to re support recovery in the community. So there were 53 weekly in the 50 square block. So there's a very, very sophisticated uh, understanding of recovery in the neighborhood, which is just another asset that's probably not acknowledged. Um, so anyway, um, this is the only area like this in the city of Los Angeles. However, just recently, uh, Supervisor Solis uh, laudably got um, you know the, the land that was going to go to expanded county jails. And when that was stopped, um, she created some housing on that, initially temporary housing, and now it's permanent housing. And she has expressed a desire to work with other uh, people in that area to um, like the California Endowment and Homeboy Industries to create a, um, a, 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 I forget what's called a hope neighborhood or a community benefit neighborhood. So this, this would be, a, in, this took me back to uh, the, the house Skid Row, what Skid Row was how it was created and how it's been over the last X, you know, number of decades. And then in other conversations with uh, an aide to one of the, someone on the city council, they were saying that they would like to create these kind of things uh, in every in every council district. So I guess the question I wanted to entertain, and this is really imagining the compassionate city, because except for Skid Row, it's all imagined at the moment. Um, but how, um, you know, if if in fact you know this were going to happen and we could be designing it right now, what would we want to make sure we designed into into such a um, situation so that it would really not just be a place where people would have housing, not just be a place where they would have services, but were a place where they would you know grow their uh, grow a community, and um, that's that's the question. And um, Jeremy, I think I'll start with you because I know when I was trying to understand this stuff. I, 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 I talked with you and you were, you illuminated me. So why don't you, why don't you talk about it? Simon? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the, I, I think the, my reaction to the initial description of it, like a community benefit neighborhood was, uh, was uh, not that enthusiastic. <laughs> um, mostly because community benefit as a, as a organizing theme is, it really harkens mostly to, for me and for, I think others and most folks in the real estate development world is a, a negotiated settlement essentially that says for something else that we're going to be doing that has nothing to do with you or is even possibly going to be harmful or at best negligent to the issue, the, the core issues and needs in a community we will set aside some funds or some resources to, you know, ameliorate that. And uh, what, came to mind is really this idea of uh, what we really need is like a purpose, you know, and purpose development. So where um, the purpose of the work and the purpose of the development in place in places is actually very intentional. Um, you know, we, I think I sort of stumbled upon this idea when another, again, riffing and re reacting to another term in real estate, which is often used is called mixed use development. And, um, you know, that might combine both commercial, like, a, 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 you know, a, a store or some kind of commercial use with some kind of residential use. The, the, the whole language and um, sort of world of real estate development is very much in these terms, so much like zoning, like what's allowed, what are the allowable uses? And really what we need to be doing is starting to talk about what are the purposes of the different zones? What are the purposes of the different development opportunities? And I, I th think the call that I would put out for Skid Row is to make sure that there's a, a demand for uh, purpose in everything that happens in the community. And, and that would lead to, I think, places where we've seen what um, Charles and his, and his organization has done is really find ways to really bring um, the communities. Uh, voice and vision to the purpose of every project and every part of a, a development and so that it no longer becomes a incidental um, benefit to the community that something might be happening but rather a purposeful intent uh, in part also not the least of with because it's a constrained area it's not a lot of space and you don't have room to be doing 
other types of projects that have incidental benefit. It really has to be all purposeful. Um, and again, this is going back to the real estate world definition and use of things like community benefits and community benefits agreements. Um, and really what we need to demand is sort of the, a purposeful plan for what happens in the neighborhood. So, um, Karen, you want to you want to pick up on this? If if we imagine not only not only Skid Row, but that it was a model for other places mm -hmm. in in the city where where I actually Hilda Solis' thing was Hope Village, but it, but the idea where people and who needed housing and resources were brought together, and then that those people were actually given supported. Uh, in generating a community that would be, um, you know, would be a real, it would be a real community and really support their their connectedness, their desires, and and their futures. Um, something like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know what? What's I've so appreciated what my colleagues on this panel have said, and what struck me when Charles was talking was that you know so much of compassion is listening you know it's like kind of the first rule of compassion is to like actually listen to um uh the other so that you actually know uh what they're about and and uh what they want as opposed to assuming um and um you know i want to just put out there too that you know we're talking about skid row but but i would say you know, a lot of people in Los Angeles are struggling. Uh, Jerry, Jeremy mentioned that one in three uh, Americans live in poverty. Well, I would tell you that that number is, is higher in Los Angeles. And, um, and even if people aren't living in poverty, our cost of living is so high, given the cost of housing, that um, it's challenging to, to really live well um, in this city. Um, we have a program that we're working on called Creating Our Next LA. And it's really about communities and people envisioning through story what they want Los Angeles to be. How has this pandemic and, and you know the crisis, but opportunity that it provides with this window on how many people are suffering to you know, envision for themselves to have self-determination about what they want to see uh, in their city. And, you know, amazingly, we have, you know, the, 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 um, the stars are aligned because we have, have this major election coming up in, in next year. Like every, almost every seat, like, like, you know, more than half of our city government is elected officials are going to be um, gone. So we have this moment to really, um, you know, come together as citizens, because I think, you know, when you ask me that question, what comes to mind is that people need to get together and think about what they want, and then advocate for it, because people know what makes a good neighborhood. Um, and so, so to um, provide an on ramp, you know, by creating this foundation of trust, by listening to each other, by, uh, you know, coming up with uh, the key things that we want in our communities. Um, you know, we have the opportunity to really create a platform that is serving people as opposed to, you know, the, the moneyed interest, which is what often happens in our capitalist society. And um, so I, you know, I just feel like, and I mean, the other sort of idea that came to me um, when I was listening was that, you know, customization does not serve anybody. And that is, that is, you know, that is the challenge of our society is that, you know, if you look at public education, if you look at healthcare, if you look at all of our systems, policing, of course, which is I mean, let's not even go there. You know, it's about this custom. I mean, about this, what, what I said, custom, the standard, we need customization is what I mean. Like we need to really think about who is getting served and, you know, design systems based on what 
we are telling our, you know, our uh, elected officials and our policymakers that really truly serve the needs of us and, and our communities. And, um, you know, I, this is something I think about all the time, you know, just about the challenge with black people in general. And, you know, like, is, does a black person get killed by the police every day? I think so, at least one person is that the systems are at odds with like our basic being, you know, when we talk about culture, um, uh, culture is really like embedded in all of our systems. So how do we use culture to move, to create systems that actually are aligned with, you know, the culture of black people, the culture of, you know, not just black people, but of everyone, which, you know, often they're not. So um, I, I would say that to create this community, we really need to have the, the community involved from the beginning, you know, before it's developed to really, you know, come to the table and with, you know, sort of knowledgeable input to really be able to make decisions about what this place is. And I would, I would echo that. And uh, the, the whole concept of just choice and agency um, and, and Skid Row is predominantly black neighborhood and, and people need to acknowledge that. I think part of the discussions I'm hearing now are um, how to fix Skid Row, but that also takes away that sense of agency because there's that sense of community also has a whole other piece to it that um, if you ask people where you want to be housed, ask them, and you'll see that a lot of folks love the neighborhood. You know, let's have a range of housing options right here where I am right now. <laughs> you know, I'm here for a reason, and it's not always because I was dumped here, or I was forced to come here. There are other things that that um, that connect people, and I think um, that definitely has to be integrated in any project you talk about uh, need, uh, purpose, um, addressing disparities. You know, we know what the disparities look like. Equity is a hot topic now, but how can we put that into practice? And um, based on what we know about uh, community conditions, uh, I think is is uh, is key. Um, when we talk about uh, the refresh spot, I've had a lot of folks reach out to me and say, "Oh, how can we build one of these in our neighborhood?" And the magic of how that came to be came from a, a group of organized community members that said, this is what we want. And uh, you have to have that connection to the community. You have to have folks who are being impacted by the issues, um, actively involved in, in what's occurring. Um, when we talk about um, housing, when we talk about community, these are uh, really complex uh, discussions. And, and one thing that I'll uh, didn't mention earlier that I wanted to bring up is there are a lot of judgments made about uh, people experiencing homelessness because people who live on the streets have no privacy. And so if you have no privacy, I can see every single thing you do in life, <laughs> you know, like your, your living room is, is open to everyone. And people in Beverly Hills and, and, and Hollywood, more affluent folks, they have uh, the luxury of privacy. So we don't see what they do. And so people make a lot of judgments based on um, what they see people on the street doing. And um, it's, not, it's not a fair approach when we talk about compassion, you know, because people like to um, blame the people for the circumstances they're in. It's like, oh, well, you're on the tank because you drink a lot. I see you drinking. You had a beer yesterday. You have beer today. <laughs> and um, But there's more substance abuse and, and, uh, occurring in the affluent communities, but there are no cameras there. People aren't there like, wow, look at all these drugs in here. Like that conversation is not happening. So I think that, that to me is a bit offensive when people say, oh, it's mental illness or substance abuse because there, there are people in affluent folks struggling with mental illness as well. Um, but I think that uh, we, folks have to be cautious and, and not try to play God when we talk about how to help the homeless. Uh, it's viewing homeless uh, 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 people who are experiencing homelessness as, as human beings that, that need support. And um, being able to, to 
uh, uh, involve them with all levels of design, I think is, is really key. One of the things that, uh, one of the practices I didn't mention um, in our engagement that we incorporate uh, centers a lot around, I did talk about music, but a lot of our community programming uh, is connected to the music and it's connected to the feedback that comes from you play a certain song and folks come and say, oh man, you don't know nothing about that. Let me tell you what you know about this, what you know. And it just kind of snowballs and, and creates a vibe where uh, it's like a vortex of energy that that focuses around this sense of connection that 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 goes across time and space. I think our efforts in Skid Row have been intentional to connect with people of African descent with the rhythms that folks are, are familiar with and, and use that as a way to really promote wellness. Um, I saw a few comments in the chat about um, increasing mental illness, increasing rates of addiction and just uh, in the whole context of COVID. And there are a lot of um, challenges with um, uh, things that folks used to access that they don't have access to anymore uh, and social spaces and places to connect I think have been a challenge but definitely in in, um, in any design that people are impacted have to have a, a, a central role at the table. Do we look at these there are some questions there should we look at them? Yeah. Hey. Okay I'll re um, let's see one says uh, anonymous attendee I live in the neighborhood and it, this is just what you were talking about, I think, Charles. Yeah, yeah. I feel over the past year, things have gotten much worse. Mm -hmm. with the population of people suffering, mental illness crisis, shooting up on the street, et cetera. I don't recall this ever seeming so desperate. Is there resistance to housing and mental health support? Is there an influx of people coming into the community from elsewhere? I feel the vibrance is being subsumed by severe mental illness, probably related to drug use. One thing I would like to say about that uh, is, in my personal view, based on my experience, is I think that when you talk about uh, substance abuse and also mental illness, to if you really look at it, those are symptoms. Those are symptoms of distress and duress that are that are created by systemic factors. Like majority of mental illness is not organic. It's not something biological. It's not something you're born with. Most a mental illness that people struggle with, it comes from trauma. It comes from social factors. It comes from the duress of, of, of not being acknowledged as a, as a, uh, as a human being. And um, I think one of the things that we try to promote is the importance of culture, the importance of resiliency, the importance of identity. Like these are things that we aren't we aren't taught, and for for folks, uh, particularly people of African descent, these were things systematically taken away from us to enslave us. It's like you have no sense of identity, you have no sense of autonomy, of agency, of independence. Of <laughs> you have your no worldview, you have no healing rituals, and that's something that is very important. How do you respond to trauma? What do you do to heal yourself? How do you respond to uh, um, grief? How do you? assist the people around you. These are tools that our ancestors had. You know, these are things that 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 communities, uh, this is the cultural wealth of communities. And, and if we don't have a connection to that, then we are susceptible to many, many um, ailments, uh, which I think uh, mental illness and substance abuse fall in those categories. Because for, for many of us, substance abuse uh, is an attempt to try to feel better in a, in a a world that doesn't feel good and how can we create you know a communities that support and acknowledge who we are i think that's part of the discussion so i have a question so so is is it because of covid i mean you know because mental illness has gotten worse outside of skid row like if you you know there are all these articles not just about um uh young people. I mean, I know mental illness has gotten, I have a 15 year old and just, you know, pay attention to teenage mental illness. And that's gotten significantly worse since COVID. addiction also and uh, the county noted in the first half of 2020, there's been a 48% increase in overdose death. And so right. addiction is also on the rise uh, right. outside of Skid Row. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a question in the in the questions, and there's also a, a, a very short uh, comment from Roberto Badoya. I see Roberto's here. Hey, Roberto. Hey, Roberto. <laughs> yeah. 
So the, and they sort of fit together. I'm going to read Lisa Davis's comment and then tag Roberto's on the end of it. So Lisa says, Los Angeles looks more polarized than six months ago in terms of what's closed and the housing and businesses are newly opened and extremes and high earners and street dwellers are more obvious than ever. What openings are there now downtown for putting this kind of equitable neighborhood we are envisioning? And then, well, may I, anyway, and Roberto says, wondering what your thoughts are about civic trauma. And I guess, um, I don't know, it seems, I think, it seems like there's all kinds of civic trauma going on, doesn't there? Isn't that right, Roberto? I don't know. <laughs> um, and I think that's um, manifested in the, in the extremes that Lisa was talking about and what we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, what open, and then Lisa says, what openings are there in, in downtown for putting in the kind of equitable neighborhood we're envisioning? Um, I think, yeah, I, I think Henriette's screaming from the living room, IX1 zone. Which would be, which, and the community plan. Which would be to maintain the affordable housing in, um, in uh, that exists in Skid Row and, and not have it uh, be occluded by market rate development, which would allow the people living in the neighborhood to manifest, you know, the, the kind of uh, articulate what their dreams and desires are for, and, to, and to realize them. Um, Tom, Gro oh, Jeremy. I, I think that what you just said, John, is really important. Market rate development will find a place for itself somewhere close enough to downtown. <laughs> It just will, it, you know, and that's the way capitalism works. And that's the way the real estate market works within capitalism. And so I think the idea that um, making sure that Skid Row, which actually has, you, you couldn't spend enough money right now to, to remake the kinds of resources and access to services and kind of community that people feel in Skid Row now, if you wanted to, like you just couldn't, you couldn't spend enough money to do it somewhere else. And so it just makes sense to say, oh, well, look, let's not build the market rate housing here <laughs> because that will, it, there's no shortage of places where that's going to happen. And so I think the idea is like, and I, and I think there is a sort of spatial maneuvering that can happen. And I think you all were getting at this with some of the research you were doing around tax increment financing and the infrastructure improvement zones, uh, districts and whatnot that, can be ways of le leveraging this idea uh, to both allow for market rate housing to happen somewhere, but also to allow for and support the kinds of housing needed in Skid Row to, ha to happen. So it looks like we're, we're running one, out of time. One thing I wanted to say quick, I know we're running out of time, uh, is that, uh, that we're, you're gonna see more folks that are unhoused because unemployment and the cost of living. So these challenges are, are gonna affect other neighborhoods. But I think for, for me, as I mentioned, this whole discussion around equity is, is also, there's a discussion around accountability. At what, at what point, you know, is the system held accountable for neglecting the needs of folks for many years um, that, that are documented in numerous reports, you know, that show disparities. That that you know, uh, what did folks say? It's not a broke system if it if it consistently produces the, the same results. It's doing what it was designed to do, and so these this disparities exist. And and what's being done to address it? Um, because the situation has has not improved, and um, I think there should be increased accountability when we talk about these issues of equity. Um, because uh, and as much as I love Skid Row, people are also um, folks who are unhoused, their, their lifespan is shorter. They say like five people a day, you know, are dying on the streets. And these are people we all know and love, you know, who are no longer with us. And, and I, I, I just wanted to put that out there. I want to just like, you know, speak to this opportunity and really respond to what Roberto said. I mean, I think we do have this opportunity to jointly process the trauma that we've gone through and to you know, kind of think about, you know, what what this what is the compassionate city that we want together, and to, and to be in conversation with each other. That's the work that we're doing, and I feel like that's the opportunity to address what's happening in Skid Row, to address what's happening in South LA, where I am, you know, and and throughout the city where people are suffering, unfortunately, so that we do get 
and push our elected officials to really be responsive uh, to the needs of the community as opposed to you know whoever they're being responsive to. I think that's a perfect, that's really a perfect place to end it because that's exactly, uh, you know, compassion is about action. It's not just about feeling bad, it's about changing things. And here's Rebecca. Close the slide out. I just really want to thank all of our panelists, Karen, Jeremy, Charles, and John, as moderator, for um, such a fascinating and incisive uh, talk. Um, I'm reminded again of the importance of the disability rights slogan, nothing about us without us. And um, I want to thank everybody for joining in on this talk. Um, everyone in the audience, please head to mocha.org to find out how you you can watch um, LAPD's performances next weekend. And if you're not able to catch them live on YouTube live, they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel afterwards. You'll have a chance to catch them later. Thanks very much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.